My name is Patricia Goff, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening on behalf of the Waterloo branch of the Canadian Institute for International Affairs, the Center for International Governance Innovation, and the Academic Council on the United Nations System. Before we get going this evening, I just want to make a few quick announcements. You will notice that you have membership no, they're not actually membership cards, are they? They're information cards on your seats. If you'd like more information about the Canadian Institute for International Affairs, fill out one of those cards and pop it in the little, uh, what looks like a ballot box at the back, and we will contact you and give you information about our organization. I just want to bring to your attention a couple of upcoming events that are taking place here at CG. One is on November 3rd, and it's a food for thought uh, talk, which means that it's going to be held at midday over the lunch hour. That one's featuring Michael Shifter from the Amer uh, Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, D.C., and he's going to be talking about U.S. approaches to the Americas. The other one I want to bring to your attention is on Thursday, November 9th in the evening, this, uh, this time, 7 p.m., and that's going to be Paul Rogers, who is a professor of peace studies at the University of Bradford in the U.K. Uh, many of you will recognize his name. He's been working on uh, peace studies issues for decades, and he He's uh, a very contributor to the international media discussing contemporary peace and conflict issues, security issues, and so on. And his talk is entitled, Into the Long War, Contemporary Threats to International Peace and Security. Okay. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Alistair Edgar to introduce our guest. Alistair, as many of you know, is the Executive Director of the Academic Council on the United Nations System. And I remember to check that my cell phone was switched off, so I'm, I'm really on the ball. Um, I'm very pleased to see uh, Craig here. Uh, I got to know Craig about uh, four and a half years ago or so, um, as he was part of the, uh, the site search committee and people looking at uh, whether or not Waterloo would become the home of Akron's. And um, I'm very pleased that he made what is obviously the right decision. Um, I'm very pleased to see that he's back here. But when he first came here, this was all talk. It was a building and nothing else inside it, particularly uh, in terms of CG. Uh, so he's also coming back to see a lot of the things uh, really coming to fruition here. I asked uh, Craig what he thought were the most important points to raise about his study here, and the two things that he mentioned to me. Uh, one was that he had the opportunity to travel uh, around the world for two years. Um, and visiting 32 countries, uh, interviewing many uh, of the, uh, the original people who were part of UNDP. And uh, fortunately uh, for us, um, being able to uh, interview them in the later stages of their lives uh, to, to capture a history uh, that we might otherwise have lost. So an extremely timely piece of work that he had the opportunity to do. Uh, the other thing, uh, I know Craig is a sports fan um, and he uh, kept on just missing meetings with Ronaldo, who's a UNDP ambassador. Um, so that's probably the one major frustration of his work, but we hope we'll, we'll remedy that sooner or later. Um, I think this will be a, a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, you're not here to listen to me. What I thought the one thing I will do, and I know you've got Craig's bio material uh, periodically popping up behind me. Um, Thomas Rees, who is our current chairperson of Aikens, uh, who uh, uh, so one chair removed from Craig's time. Uh, uh, just uh, to read the, the piece that's on the back of, of the book, and I should just point out the book is for sale in the back here, $43.46. Um, Thomas's uh, commentary, students of development, the United Nations and international relations have waited a long time for this authoritative examination of the UNDP. Informative, provocative, and controversial, this book provides the largest remaining missing piece in the historical puzzle of post-war multilateralism. Uh, I know that I'm definitely looking forward to uh, hearing what Craig has to tell us today. So thank you, Craig. Thank you, Alistair, and thank, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I, I'm very grateful to be here and to have the chance to talk with you about this research that I've been doing for the last 24 months that did result in the book, the cover of which is, is, is up above you. 
Um, I'm going to talk about four things. I'll probably get to the UN reform part only at the, at the very end. But the four things are to say a little bit about the UN Development Program because I, I think it's something that isn't necessarily that well known. To talk about the organization as a learning organization, which, is, which I think is a, um, not a bad way to characterize it. Um, to say something about what UNDP as an organization, as something that's been around for 60 years in different forms, uh, learned about the problems of development. And then the very end is to talk about future aspects of UN reform, to talk about Kofi Annan's reform agenda, and then some of the things that the history of UNDP could tell us about the likelihood of achieving some of that reform agenda. So first, to say something about UNDP as an organization. Um, UNDP operates in about 160, 166, I guess, at the last count, countries around the world. It uh, serves as the coordinator of the UN system in the field. is It's really the primary role uh, of the, the key figures of the, of the United Nations Development Program, who are the so-called resident representatives and usually take the same job as, or another job that's called resident coordinator of the United Nations. The United Nations system, uh, the organization chart, which I'm not going to put up in front of you because it's much too horrible to even consider, has 90 three separate organizations listed on the traditional organization chart. Most of them are autonomous from one another. Um, the only coordination that takes place in the field of most of these organizations goes through a person who is a UN coordinator who in most cases also happens to be part of this organization. And so that's part of the history of the organization that's, that's very important. The second part of the history that's very important is that UNDP has acted from the very beginning as the primary incubator of other organizations that become important development organizations. In its early years, the predecessor to UNDP was actually the funder of most of the early development work of the rest of the international organization system that then has done development ever since then, including organizations like the Food and Agricultural Organization and, and the, the WHO. When those organizations were first started, the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the people who started them back in the 40s didn't imagine that they were going to become development organizations, which is largely what they are now. And they started to become development organizations partially because of the, largely actually initially, because of the funding work that came through this outfit that was called UNDP. Uh, even today, UNDP acts as an incubator of other organizations. Sitting inside UNDP at the moment officially is UN Volunteers, is UNIFEM, the UN's uh, organ fund that is concerned with, with uh, the development of women. And also sitting inside UNDP are, some people would argue, the beginnings, one would hope, of a coherent uh, environment and development organization. Uh, which may or may not ever be created, and uh, a, an effective uh, development and AIDS organization, which may or may not be created. So it's acted as an incubator, um, having influence over at least 45 of those 93 things that are, that are on the, the, the UN chart. Um, finally, it's been a source of ideas. Oh, I guess there were two more that are here. One, it's been a source of ideas, the human development ideas that are often associated with, with, the, uh, with UNDP. And UNDP has acted as a promoter of democracy quite unofficially for a very long time. And since the, the late 1980s, the beginning of the, of the 1990s, as an advocate by this time as a very, um, if you look at all the kind of organization charts of UNDP these days, they will say its primary goal is to be concerned with something called democratic governance. Okay. The origins of UNDP, the, the guy who's in this picture up here is someone named Sir Robert Jackson who, for those of you who know the history of the UN, he's a really big deal. Um, he's a big enough deal that if you go to MIT, where my wife teaches, there is this plaque sitting on a wall showing Sir Robert, who was one of the, the great, um, he, he was a person who, who coined the phrase, big is beautiful. He, he was a, a believer in very large scale and successful at very large scale uh, industrialized uh, development projects like large scale dams, infrastructure, things of that sort, which is why he's liked very much at, at MIT. 
he was involved with a whole series of organizations, including UNDP, that were really predecessors of UNDP. And it's kind of an odd sort of thing that they, much of the high set of ideas of how to run the organization and much of the staff of UNDP came from organizations that existed before the modern United Nations. They started with something called the, the, uh, the Middle East um, Coordinating Committee or, mid, or, or uh, Office for the Control of the Middle East, which was part of the British Empire's way of dealing with the economic issues of the Second World War. Much of the staff and ideas of that organization, which Sir Robert Jackson actually kind of invented, um, was then taken over to the wartime organization that was called the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRWA. Sir Robert Jackson was number two in that organization. Many of the same people and ideas were taken from that organization to the first UN technical assistance organization right at the beginning of, of the UN's history. And then all of those ideas, much of the staff as well, went into something called the Expanded Program for Technical Assistance, the EPTA. Uh, which got a, a parallel organization with a little bit more money by the 1950s called the Special Fund. And then finally in 1966, the Special Fund and the Expanded Program for Technical Assistance were merged together in something called UNDP. There is a very strong connection among all of these organizations. And I treat everything from the first technical assistance organization as a predecessor of the, of the current United Nations organization. Um, now, UNDP as a learning organization. As a learning organization, that means that UNDP is one of those, of those awful organizations that have management retreats and where people learn from management schools and all kinds of crazy things of that sort. What you have up here is the result of one of those management retreats. Middle level, um, young middle level managers in their, 1930, in their 30s were taken to some place, I think in England in the mountains, um, it's Wales, I suppose. And they were told they had to draw UNDP as an animal. And the animal that they drew is right there in front of you. Uh, it's, it's an elephant, as you, as you can see. Um, as an elephant, it means it's old. Uh, elephants have lived very long, as, as most mammals do. Is wise, that's part of the learning organization. It also has glasses on, in case you didn't notice it was wise. Um, it's a bit like Gandhi kind of looks like that, um, or a bit like Ganesh, you know, the, the, the favorite god who is the remover of obstacles. Uh, and of course, it's a flying elephant, so it's an organization that tries to do the impossible. Um, it, the image that you see here, though, is very much the image not only of the culture of the organization itself, but there's some small validity to it. I don't think the elephant has actually ever flown uh, quite, but, but there are aspects of UNDP, unlike a lot of other uh, UN organizations, where it has been, does seem to be an organization that has been, is old and wise, has been able to learn things over the years. And I just want to very briefly talk about some of the things that UNDP, the organization UNDP learned over the years. Um, initially, it was the first of the multilateral development organizations concerned with so-called technical assistance, with bringing ideas to uh, the developing world. And it invented many of the things that are now typical of development organizations. There are people in the old, old, old timers in UNDP who say they invented the development project. I'm not sure that that's exactly right. Uh, and they certainly invented the idea of the project cycle. They invented many of the ideas uh, concerned with how to, how to figure out how to do voluntary funding for development. A number of the startup issues. UNDP is also an organization that became very suspicious relatively early on of the kind of large scale big projects that were very much the idea of development for a very long period of time. In the book, I talk about uh, W. Arthur Lewis, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for his work, work in economics, for his work on development. When Lewis was working with UNDP in the late 1950s and it became the designer of the policies of the, of, of, um, the special fund, Lewis was already becoming terribly suspicious of the degree to which the large scale dam, the large scale road project would actually result in the kinds of, of development uh, that people expected in the 50s and 60s. And a later 
figure in UNDP, a guy named Brad Morse, who was the administrator or head of the organization in the 1980s, was even brought in to the World Bank when the World Bank finally got to the, the point where they started to become suspicious of their own large-scale dam projects, et cetera. And they needed to find a strong external figure to come in and be the consultant to tell them that the stuff that they were doing was not what they wanted to do. That's how these lots of organizations work. You know, you figure out you're going to change something, and then you bring in your consultant to, to tell you. It was from UNDP that they found such a person. Um, some of the other things, I'm not sure if, if I'll be able to go through all of them, but one of the most important w bits of work that UNDP did, again under Brad Morse, starting in 1979, is that UNDP did a great deal of work with so-called revolutionary regimes and revolutionary movements. Morse was really interested, directly after Camp David, in supporting the formation of, of Palestinian um, state building capacity and supporting indirectly and very much outside of the limelight um, the PLO and the possibilities of rebuilding Palestine and rebuilding the state within Palestine. Uh, UNDP was also the only international organization uh, ever brought in by Deng Xiaoping uh, to help with the, the transformation of the Chinese economy, to sort of show some of the ways of, of creating a, a, uh, um, a, bit of, a bit of a market economy in its early years. Um, Shortly after, again in the late 1970s, early 1980s, Vietnam did the same thing. So there were a number of places where the idea that at least the administrator of the organization at that time had was that if UNDP could quietly, behind the scenes, provide extraordinary technical assistance to certain regimes that were often uh, treated as an anathema by other countries in the world, that that might change both those regimes and the perception of, of uh, major powers. The other place where they were working starting in 79 was with uh, the uh, revolutionary regime in Iran. I got a chance to visit most of these places and talk with you know, about the, some of the things that went on. Um, some of the things, UNDP was a little early on in terms of, of supporting women, democratization. The human development reports are probably one of the most important things that UNDP has done, uh, which are these reports that not only are done at a national level and an international level, but even down in some countries at local levels that, to that involve uh, civil society groups in doing research and setting up new indicators of what development might mean for our city, for our state, for our country, that differ from the kinds of indicators that are often used by, by uh, uh, folks con concerned with development in other places. And then finally, just to the last point, um, in the 20, 21st century, from 2000 to about 2005, UNDP went through a major massive administrative reform before any other organization within, within the United Nations did. I could put more things up there, but there are many examples, of, again, of, of UNDP having learned over many years. Okay, how did UNDP learn? I've been telling some of my friends that, he, that, that I'm a social scientist and I wrote a history book. Social scientists don't like to write history. My, my wife's a historian. His, she says that, you know, historians, we go in and we just read the record and we write the narrative. We don't have hypotheses or anything of that sort. We don't necessarily try to explain anything. I wanted to try to explain something because I'm sort of a social scientist. And the thing that I was, tr was interested in trying to explain after I started the, this work was trying to explain why it is that UNDP looks like a learning organization, even though it doesn't have some of the main characteristics that us international relations faculty think are the characteristics of learning organizations. So there's some students here, so you may, have, you, you may follow some of this. There's this really strong theory among uh, international relations scholars, that the international organizations that tend to learn a lot are organizations attached to a so-called epistemic community. Does that phrase mean anything to, to you? But a community of a knowledge-creating community of scientists, essentially, of different sorts. And that the knowledge that is gained by the, those international organizations that learn really comes from their connection to 
a community of scientists who are doing the learning. So that WHO, for example, is a learning organization, but it's only a learning organization because it's really closely tied in with medical science and with public health. The World Bank is a learning organization because it's tied into neoclassical economics, right? So that's, that's kind of the, one of the big theories that scholars of international re relations have. Well, you can see from this slide that I have a very different argument about why UNDP works the way it does. One of the phrases that I use throughout the book is that UNDP is this strange association of Fabians and Republicans. The Fabians are the staff of UNDP. UNDP had initial uh, overseer was a chap by the name of David Owen, who was the first person hired by the United Nations. Uh, he told stories about, you know, kind of arriving in the church in London in January of, of 1946, the church that was supposed to be the secretariat headquarters of, of the UN, knocking on the door and saying, hello, I'm the United Nations, because he was literally the first employee, employee of the secretariat. Owen was a British bureaucrat associated with the Labour Party, a Fabian. And the people that he hired and that then have been hired since then are people who were hired in his image. They're people who deeply believe in ideas like democracy and uh, caring for the poor. But UNDP has this strange situation where you've got a staff who deeply believes in democracy and caring for the poor and has had that since 1946. But at the same time, the first principle of the organization, unlike, say, the World Bank, the first principle of UNDP is they will aid every developing country government to do the form of development that that government wishes to have. That means they aid Cuba to be a better communist regime. They aid Singapore to be a better capitalist regime. They aid Bhutan to serve, um, what, what's it called, national, gross national happiness. I guess that's the, the official goal of, of the, the, the Buddhist government of, of Bhutan. Every, the goal of UNDP, primary goal, is to do what the developing country government wants. You've got people who want to do what the developing country government wants, but on the other hand, who are personally deeply committed to democracy and the poor. Tension. And it's within that tension that you've got a great deal of the creativity of the organization. Staff-related tension. The Republican side is this. The UNDP, since its beginning, has almost always been governed at the top of the organization by someone who is uh, appointed, literally, I, except it's only the real world version of it, by a Republican president of the United States. You know how the UN works, all of the UN system as a whole works. Um, there's a tendency for all of the high jobs to kind of go to particular countries at particular periods of time. UNDP is one of those high jobs that was whoever is nominated by the President of the United States until very recently was the person who got the job. And for at least three of the most important people to run the organization, um, the person who did the nominating was a Republican President of the US. The first head of UNDP was a guy named Paul Hoffman who had been head of the, the Marshall Plan and then stayed in the job running UNDP until 1971 when he was in his 80s, appointed really by Dwight Eisenhower. The second really key person was a guy named Brad Morse, who was the only liberal Republican who supported Richard Milhouse Nixon for president, and he was rewarded for his support by Nixon nominating him for a couple of good important UN jobs. The third really key figure was a guy, Bill Draper, who got the job because he had been George Bush the first uh, college roommate. And Ronald Reagan had the chance to nominate someone and he knew that his vice president um, knew something about the UN. So he asked him who to nominate and he nominated Bill Draper. The administrators, all three of these guys, happened to have been incredibly competent at what they were doing. They also happened to be people who actually were tied in, in peculiar ways, to the people who were the biggest 
um, those who resisted, I guess would be the better way to put it, were the biggest critics of, of the UN's development work, who tended to be isolationists within the United States, which for many, many years was the major donor to UNDP as, as well as the rest of the development system. And a second part of the creativity of UNDP came from this tension between these Republican administrators who had to go and raise the money for this voluntary organization and their goals of development, yet their, also their, both their intimate knowledge and their desire to react to relatively conservative forces. So second major theme of the book. Um, the guy who's the administrator here is, is actually Bill Draper, my, the, who's the, the hero of, of, of the book in a variety of ways. He's the guy who brought in human development and a whole bunch of other things. The way that this creativity has operated is through the way in which UNDP um, carries out much of its work. And the sort of phrase, UNDP's fuzzy edge, means many different things. It's the edge that UNDP has that makes it a learning organization. But it's also a fuzzy edge that's connected with um, about three or four other notions. One of the great figures in, in UNDP's history was a chap by the name of Mebubul Haq. He was the person that uh, Bill Draper brought to UNDP and told him he could do whatever he wanted if he would just come to the organization and work for it. And Ulhaq is the chap who invented the human development reports, both initially the global human development reports and then, and then this series of national, local, et cetera, et cetera, reports after them. Ulhaq used to say that human beings, all human beings were either mammals or mollusks. And mollusks are people who are hard and tough on the outside, but you hit them and they're just mushy and they all fall apart, right? Um, mammals are warm and fuzzy on the outside, but they have a backbone, you know, you, you punch them and, and they turn into something else. And arguably, Draper and Ulhaq are the guys who sort of turned UNDP into an organization that really had a very strong backbone as well as being fuzzy. Because Draper decided that not only were they going to start publishing all these crazy human development reports that were actually going to be working with civil society organizations, but that UNDP was going to be start to be very public about its advocacy, about many of those things that those Fabians believed in, like democracy, the rights of women, um, the rights of the poor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, not saying that we're, they were going to change their policies, but they were going to start being very clear about this advocacy. So UNDP becomes a mammal, and mammals, as you know, are fuzzy. And so what's the fuzzy part of UNDP? Well, the fuzzy part of UNDP is all of these kind of weird people who are up there. Some of these people, some of you might be able to recognize. I don't know if any, can anyone recognize any, any of them up here? Probably not, maybe, perhaps. But, these are all people who um, would argue that they've worked for UNDP at one time or another. They include some fairly famous economists. They include the heads of, of many of the world's most well-known large-scale um, non-governmental organizations like SEWA or Santi La Sante in, in uh, uh, Haiti um, or the, the women's part of the NU in Indo Indonesia. Um, UNDP has a fuzzy edge that is all of these people who work with UNDP, get funded by UNDP, but are not part of UNDP. The current head of UNDP when he came into the organization, uh, Kamal Dervish, asked how many people were employed by the organization and he was told, we don't know. And then a little while later, it was explained to him, well, we think we have six to 7,000 people who are on kind of regular UN contracts. But there's somewhere around maybe 10 to 13,000 other people who are doing things like working on various human development reports or working as research assistants for someone working on a democracy report someplace or another or getting a subcontract to a, a, a non-governmental organization that is actually terribly critical of us, but we really need them to be involved in, in order to get to various citizens, et cetera, et cetera. So the fuzzy part of UNDP, the mammal, the thing that makes it actually work as a learning organization 
is all of these weird people who are not necessarily part of the organization. Um, I didn't think this up myself, although I, you know, I really wish as the social scientist I'd, I'd understood this. This was explained to me, not in these terms and not, of course, as eloquently, um, by um, Amartya Sen, who is a, would, could be one of those people who, who would, could be sitting up there in that picture. I think I'm in the picture, too. Yeah, um, I'm over, over there with, with the uh, Human Rights Center in, in Iran. I'm, I'm the guy who's, yeah, anyway. Um, but Sen explained to me, UNDP doesn't work like those organizations tied to a particular epistemic community because development is not an, a field in which there is a particular science. So I shook my head and go, oh, if Amartya Sen says there's no science associated with development, then that must be true. He says, no, you know, what development is, is a field in which there are many people who share a set of, of ideas, but they have not theorized all of the things that they share, nor do they really want to theorize them. And what UNDP is, an, is a, a kind of organization that's tied into thousands of epistemic communities, probably not thousands, he said thousands, but he exaggerates, maybe 20 or 30, um, that contribute to development in this kind of under-theorized way. It's the openness, the institutional openness to an extremely large group of people working in, in uh, a practical field that makes the organization capable of coming up with new ideas. Okay, that may be right. Um, the, the test for those of you who are students would be to identify 10 of the people in this photograph. No. Um, <laughs> okay. Finally, the main topic of the night, which is UN reform and anything that UNDP would say about UN reform. Uh, the, I, the person I was hired by at, at the United Nations is a guy named Mark Malik Brown, who works directly under Kofi Annan, so, which of course makes me the third most important person in the United Nations, right? Uh, <laughs> but because of the person I work for, um, I've heard a lot about Kofi Annan's reform agenda. And the way Malik Brown frequently will summarize it is he'll say there are really only four key points to it. There's the impossible thing of trying to reform the uh, Security Council. And then there are the really important things, which are creating new or reformed institutions that reflect the greater de degree of consensus on democracy and human rights, which now exists within the United Nations. That's including things like reforming the Human Rights Commission, but it's a lot more than that. It's actually reforming a lot of the UN structure to, to reflect on some of the greater post-Cold War consensus that, that exists. The second big thing is coordinating or restructuring um, the UN as a whole to eliminate costly duplication, especially duplication in the field. And the final thing is administrative reform, getting greater transparency, accountability, and effectiveness. Well, I think there are two lessons for these, these things that come from UNDP's history. The first has to do with administrative reform. Malik Brown, he's the guy who, in, in the photograph back there, who looks a little bit like uh, John Lithgow. Um, the one, yeah. Uh, Ma Malik Brown was able to do massive reform in UNDP under very strange conditions, under conditions that not only included um, a financial crisis, which UNDP was losing money and was not getting donors to, get, to turn the money in in the, in the period immediately after the Cold War, but he was also in a, in a period of time where his predecessor, who was a guy named Gus Speth, who was the person, the human being in the small picture up there. Gus Speth had spent four or five years streamlining the organization and getting the organization very strongly, culturally behind a very narrow set of principles. An idea that sustainable human development was the one thing that the organization was going to do and that it believed, the organization really believed in that very, very strongly. Malik, what Malik Brown was able to do is say to donors, to those who were supposed to bring money into the organization, I, if you believe in these principles, 
you're going to have to start returning money to this organization. And I will promise you that in, if you do that, the organization will be the most efficient organization out there for this. At the same time, he was able to go to UNDP staff and say, we all believe in these principles. And that means that if we're going to survive, there are going to have to be some major changes, changes that are kind of like that cartoon character up there. The cartoon character is a hemulin, um, which is a, a very mean and nasty and kind of narrow-minded um, figure in a set of Finnish cartoons. And I've been told, was told over and over again while I was in UNDP that the people who did the administrative reform in UNDP, mostly I was told this by Finnish staffers and Japanese staffers, they like the same things, were real hemulans. You can have the hemulans there to do the reform if you are faced both by a financial crisis and you have a real strong staff morale and commitment to a particular set of principles at a particular moment. Uh, the UN as a whole may soon be faced with another one of those financial crises, but it's not unified behind a clear sense of what it's supposed to be doing in the way the organization within the UN, UNDP, was at the time of its administrative reform. Reform for democratization, that sort of second sort of thing. Well, UNDP has been doing that for years, um, but the only way that they've been effective, oddly enough, is because it's an organization that does not order governments around. I mean, the way in which UNDP has been effective as a promoter of democracy has a great deal to do with the notion that the first principle of the organization is that we serve our sovereign state members whatever they want which gives them a degree, the organization a degree of credibility to deal with questions of democratization. In the last like three or four chapters of the book, I think I have seven instances of major democratic change where figures in UNDP were, were very central to the change, including in Indonesia, which is actually probably the most inter interesting story. Um, in each one of those cases, the only way the organization was able to be that successful was because of the credibility it had built up by dealing with sovereignty, you know, accepting sovereignty. I think there's a way in which um, perhaps my boss and his boss were spending too much time over the last couple of years thinking that, they, that the UN had become, that the international community had become a believer in a set of principles that really were not necessarily quite as universal as, as they thought. Um, finally, the big negative lesson of, of UNDP. Kofi Annan wanted to spend part of his, you know, his last year as Secretary General not doing what he spent his time doing. He wanted to spend his time creating a coherent organization out of the entire UN system that would be a field-based organization where there's little duplication and where um, things could be done in the most efficient way possible. That's not happened. In a way, the reason it has not happened is because so much of what the way in which the international organization system itself expands and takes on new tasks is by creating new organizations. We don't really have another way of doing things. So that by take, whenever the UN system takes on new tasks, it creates new organizations that create a problem of coordination. The organizations each have their own constituency. The organizations often begin as the hobby horse of one particular country, one particular set of donors, something of that sort. And that means that, the, again, the coordination problems are become extremely difficult. The history of UNDP is the history of the creation of all of these new, new partially, the creation of all of these, these new uh, areas and the impossibility of ever kind of bringing them all back together under a single organizational structure. Um, all of that is to say that this history book, which you all have to go out and, and buy, um, may tell you something about how to deal with some of the issues of making the UN a better uh, server of democratization, they may tell you some things about how to do administrative reform, but they're not going to tell you how to do uh, the larger coordination things. In fact, they'll tell you that it's a much more difficult thing than I think many of the people who are trying to do UN reform ever could imagine. Thanks a lot.
Great. Thank you. Yes, of course. Okay. Dr. Murphy is uh, open to questions. Anybody who has a question, I just ask you to step to one of the mics in the center aisle. Not all at once, though. Don't, don't rush for them. Regarding the, uh, the four points yes. of the reform agenda, uh, which point uh, do you believe has the best chances of uh, fruition? I actually think that the the relatively large scale administrative reform is the one that, that's the most likely to to get anywhere, and that which could happen, certainly it's not going to happen in the next two months while Kofi Annan is there, but it could happen if if you get uh, people within the organization, including the new Secretary General, uh, willing to work internally to uh, reinforce and kind of get the, the major cultural issues of, of the UN forward, kind of get everybody on the UN staff back on the same page that we, this organization exists for a particular set of principles and we are believers in those principles. And at the same time, if you continue to have the same sort of budgetary pressure, but you're also gonna to have to have a couple of those hemulans. You're gonna to have to have a few people within the organization who are quite willing to come in with principles that are manage. The, the way Mark Malik Brown talks about it is uh, he was able to bring UNDP from organizational principles of the 1940s all the way up to the 1980s um, in 2003. And then he'll frequently say, you realize the rest of the United Nations system is basically run the way um, the British ran India in 1946. So there's a, you need a little bit of additional uh, pushing and, and shoving. You need the hemulans as well as the, the staff agreeing on something as well as the budgetary pressure. Hi, Dr. Murphy. Thank you for your talk today. I'm in Alistair's Peace and Reconstruction class, and there are half of a, or a bunch of us here that are really interested in hearing about what you think the UNDP's role in is in like post-conflict reconstruction, talking about things like DDR and that kind of thing, and how the UNDP works with civil organizations to deal with issues in post-conflict reconstruction? Yeah. Uh, the, the, this has been one of the things that, if, that UNDP has, has actually done for a long time, but it has only sort of been officially doing, that is to say that there's been a bureaucracy within the organization that, that is, has uh, uh, a, a so-called director in charge of it uh, since 1999. Um, a lot of UNDP's um, post-conflict reconstruction work depends both on the people who are the resident, rep resident coordinator, resident representative, and on the demands of the particular government. So that you, I could sort of do a chart of things that work well, things that work poorly in, in different areas. And if you were going to say, why do some things work well, why do some things work poorly? The ones that work well usually have a combination of someone or a series of people who are very good uh, resident coordinators, uh, Rwanda post-1996, for example. And then a government that is, the sets of things that the government is asking for turn out to be things that are, are, are quite sensible. Like uh, in, in the R R Rwanda case, there's a lot of stuff about education that is, has been quite important. In every case where things have worked well, there's been a, a great deal of work with civil society organizations. No question about that. Um, in cases where things haven't worked quite as well as perhaps they might have, there's, a tendency, there's been a tendency for the governments to be asking for primarily for security support. So that if you say, look in Sierra Leone, which should be a big success story or should be something that's very good, a lot of UNDP's work has been in building prisons and, and um, you know, doing, doing certain kinds of security training, which might be very worthwhile, but, but might not be the thing that UNDP is best at. Um, and then there are places and groups of staff that are good at dealing with civil society and groups of staff that are not good at dealing with civil society. When I was in Timor-Leste doing research for this book, um, I was really struck by the way in which, which is you know, a very good story in many, in many cases, but I was very struck by the, w the way in which in the UNDP offices in Timor-Leste, there were a lot of people at relatively senior levels who, um, were very upset about civil society organizations that were critical of UNDP. 
they would say, you know, we're the United Nations. How can we have these people that, that, that are writing, publishing newspapers saying that UNDP is wasting money on this, that, or the other thing? Um, in that situation, the, the lines of communication between, you know, that fuzzy surface of the organization and the places from which it gets its ideas were disappearing. And there were people in Timor-Leste who believed, didn't know, that there were problems of legitimacy of the government that they were supporting. And they would have known it if they just walked down the street as, you know, you didn't have to be too, you know, you could be me, which means you can be pretty dumb, and figure that out in a couple of days by going and talking with some of, some of the people in, in the, the NGOs um, who had had relationships with the organization. So a lot of stuff really does have to do with kind of the personal, Added the group of people of, of the UN in a particular country and their, their abilities and their, their sensitivities, their willingness uh, to deal with the NGO community. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Craig, for a really enlightening talk, put a lot of things together about the history of the organization. And I just wanted to ask you about one thing on the slide that was an earlier slide that you didn't maybe elaborate on, which was the incubation role of the UNDP and perhaps um, a new environment and development organization. Yeah. I wonder if this has anything to do with the calls for a world environment organization, or is it a new improved uh, UN EP? Yeah, I mean, I mean, what really, it, and I don't know whether it's, whether it's one or the other, but certainly what happened when Gus Speth was head of, of UNDP in the 1990s, uh, particularly af after Rio, is that there, there were a, lots of mandates coming out, out, out of Rio and a lot of interest in environment and development um, issues. UNEP just didn't have the capacity to do any of that stuff. UNDP had this guy who really wanted, cared about that stuff as, as its boss, so he started to build that capacity within the organization, hire people, you know, stick them in the field, get governments that actually cared about environment and development things to make requests and then fulfill those requests. Um, so there's, you know, there's a staff organization, et cetera, et cetera, there. When you ask people within the organization, well, why is UNDP doing environmental stuff? There's a historical answer, which is the one I just gave you. But, the, but there's also this kind of larger answer, which is we really hope that sometime soon there will be, and you know, the, the usual answer inside UNDP is we want a world and environment and development organization. That's what we really want. And we'll have part of the core staff from here can all go over to Bonn or wherever the, wherever the new headquarters is going to be and, and be ready to, to, to work on that. But there, the political will doesn't exist yet. Um, neither the demands from the developing world nor the political will from the, the, the developed countries to, to create such an organization. But the history of, the organ of UNDP is such that if that ever happens, you, I, I'd be willing to bet very large amounts of money that the staff changes and that that kind of role will be exactly as I've described it. And then, and, and then 15 years from now, UNDP will not do environment and development, just as I think 15 years from now, UNDP will not do, will probably not be doing AIDS. It'll still be doing democratic governance because that's actually, has always been its core mission. Um, hello, Dr. Murphy. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Um, my question sort of comes back to you and reform, and I don't know if you clarified this in your, in your presentation there. But my question was about the lessons that UNDP's reform, which you said happened earlier than the current UN reform agenda um, under Kofi Annan. I was wondering what lessons UNDP's reform agenda could teach the current reform agenda for the UN as a whole. So uh, I know the one, the UN reform that is happening right now is sort of based on the, on the high level panels report there. And it's more related to threats and, and challenges and terrorism, things like that. And UNDP's is more development. But I was wondering if there was, if you could isolate one particular lesson the UNDP could share with the UN as a whole to improve its overall structural reform. Well, I, I, I think it's the, the, the lesson that I was trying to say at the end of the talk, which is that efficiency and administrative reform, those, those sorts of things, are accomplishable if there is a strong sense of mission within the organization as, as a whole as it confronts financial crises. 
That's one lesson. But the other lesson is that maybe if the UN is taking on new roles relative to terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, that there isn't going to be coherence. You know, maybe you don't actually have to have coherence. Maybe you have an organization that works quite well with uh, 93 different centers of power and some coordination in the field. And maybe some of the things that the high level panel, you know, are kind of trying to imagine that we can have this unified, coherent organization responding to new threats as well as everything that, 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 that has gone on in the past. Maybe it would be best if we just sort of smiled and said that we don't necessarily need to have that that particular um, set of goals. You. Hi, my, name, um, my question is about Darfur. Um, the UN failed in Rwanda and the international community, and I'm wondering with the current situation going on in Darfur and the underfunded African Union, what's going on with them, and the possibility of them pulling out in December, do you think or when is the UN going to mobilize some troops or somehow have talks with the international community to put to put some troops in there for, or to find the, U, the African Union so they're not by themselves stabilizing the community there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm probably no more qualified to answer that question than, than you are. Uh, only because the, you know, the, the part of the UN that I've been looking at is definitely not the Security Council and, and, and the activities of the Security Council. So the decisions to send in troops at, at si significant levels are going to be decisions made in in the Security Council, not by not by the you know, resident representatives sitting in, in one place or, or another. Um, certainly, there has been a commitment of, at a at the level of staff of many of the different UN agencies to try to do things right in by the people of Darfur. I mean, the, one of the differences between Rwanda in 1994 and Darfur today is in Rwanda in 1994, as Peter Uven, I think pointed out and you know quite successfully and has been sadly is that many of the development agencies operating in the field knew what was happening and didn't really wait raise uh, a hue and cry that's not been the case in Darfur um, lots of different organizations I mean there's an almost uh, there's kind of an unsung story of, of, of a hero of someone who works for the UN uh, fund for population activities Pam Delarge who is I think one of the been one of the major people who you know made it clear to uh, much of the s those in New York not not just people in the secretariat but also also from from a number of the of the delegations that something awful was was going on so in that sense it's there's perhaps something better that has gone on at the staff level but troops going in building you know building up the forces of the of the african union etc that's the security council's doing and i honestly don't know what's going to happen there um can we just disconnect this here i don't think it detaches the microphone raise it okay yep. <laughs> all right um, I was uh, specifically wondering about the situation in, in Afghanistan. Um, we hear a lot about uh, the troop movements in Afghanistan and, and stuff like that, but I was wondering what would be the operational range of UNDP in Afghanistan? Would they be particularly going with, like, uh, would it make sense for them just to be to stay with the military and where they go, or do they go out to communities on their own sometimes to reach out to community elders and propose planning projects that way as well. Yeah, um, again, what I know about really recent things in, in um, Afghanistan only comes from knowing one of, you know, just knowing one of the people in, in, in who works for UNDP and staying in, in email contact with him, so I'm not sure whether I've got you know, good reports or not. Um, UNDP is, of course, most active in the capital. I mean, as, as everybody is. Um, the, there are UN security rules that, that essentially mean that when most of the time when UNDP people are going out into different parts of the countryside, they are actually accompanied by people with arms. There's, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, on the other hand, and this is... It, it, 
in, in many crisis countries, and certainly in Afghanistan, one of the characteristics, not just of UNDP, but of many UN agencies, is that an awful lot of staff people do an awful lot of things that they're not supposed to do, um, in the sense of not necessarily following their own security um, rules all the time, and which may be good or may be bad. And, and, and it's certainly the case that some of the people associated with UNDP have, and also with some of the other uh, agencies have been trying very hard to make connections with different groups within society all over the country and perhaps have not always followed their own security rules. Does that at all answer? <laughs> no. um, you can turn off the radio and, you know, I mean, the way you follow, don't follow your security rules is quite fun, but. <laughs> Hi, Professor Murphy. I just had a question because you mentioned on top of dealing with any states, you mentioned the uh, dealt with groups like the PLO, and yeah. I was just wondering how the UNDP went around dealing with, you know, stateless people, you know, groups like the PLO, the Kurds, how you send developments to people that are, you know, large groups that don't necessarily have a state, and right. then whether that's meant as, you know, an endorsement of kind of self-determination in sure. the same way that they, you know. I mean, it, with the story in Palestine is actually a, a, a really, really interesting one, um, and, you know, Camp David, uh, the Camp David Accords in, in 79 imagined that there was going to be a very sh a short transition to the establishment of, of local aut autonomous control in the Palestinian territories. And the Israeli government was actually interested, not just, um, not just guys hanging out in UNDP, the Israeli government was interested in getting some help from a UN agency that they didn't, didn't dislike to uh, work with that, that sort of thing. So the, the guy who was head of UNDP at the time, who was, as I said, was an American, a Republican congressman from Lowell, Massachusetts, um, brought a couple of, of people out of retirement from the organization so that initially they could be, a, they could be a little bit at arm's length, um, sent them to Palestine and Palestinian territories to talk with local NGO leaders, most of whom didn't want to talk with them because they said you had to really kind of go to Tunis and talk, you know, you had to, you had to go and talk with the, the leaders of, of different Palestinian groups outside the country. And after a few months, um, they started making those visits too. And all of this, you know, these were things that for literally for years uh, were kept quite sub rosa, so that money started to go into and projects started to start to start in the in the territories, rebuilding hospitals, roads, fish markets, all kinds of odd, odd things, um, under with the, the is, Israeli military authorities uh, allowing them to take place and cooperating with them, and with uh, various Palestinian leaders outside of the country also cooperating with the same folks. Um, but nobody could really stand up and say that this, you know, it wasn't the kind of thing where you wanted to, to talk about this happening. And it's one of the big problems with much of the story of the UN. I mean, the, the, at the very beginning of the book, I talk about the guy who was the first resident representative, a guy named Arthur Wakefield, who said that the major principle of the organization is that we have to do things without publicity. And then Arthur Lewis, the, who became the sort of person who defined the, the norms of the organization, said that you, the organization must always operate in twilight or else we will not be able to do the kind of work that we've done. And I, you know, at one point, as I was, particularly as I was writing about the things about Palestine and some of the early things, I was thinking, gee, I know that this organization is actually doing some similar things today that I can't write about, or at least I'd, I'd feel really bad about writing about. Um, but I'm even worried about writing about 1980 in Palestine because it's describing a set of processes that if you're actually just talked about too much, um, they might not be able to work anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Similar question with the previous two. Would you be able to comment on the role of UNDP in the reconstruction of Iraq? Probably not. Um, I, 
although I can't, I, I, there's one really great part about the UNDP and the reconstruction of Iraq is, you know, af after the uh, the bombing that, d that destroyed the, the UN office there and, and killed um, the, one of the people who was really, who was the head of the office and was one of the people who was really well liked within the organization as a whole, um, the UN moved out outside of the country and now people come in and out on in short term missions basically from Oman. But there was actually a single person in the Baghdad office who insisted on keeping the office open, a, a Iraqi national, uh, a woman, um, who was from UNIFEM and who, um, you know, against all her security rules and all of, all of that sort of stuff, basically kept um, the UN presence there for a number of months before the UN had figured out how to be able to jump in and out out, out of Iman. And I think that that's actually the kind, you know, the kind of thing that uh, many U UN organizations are very good at. It's, it's people going well above doing things that are quite, uh, require a great deal of courage uh, in awful situations. I ended up writing in the book a, a, a paragraph about whether I, uh, there are people within UNDP who think that it is uh, one of the greatest moral crisis of the organization that it's been involved in Iraq uh, throughout the, the, the uh, entire war. Um, and there are others who think that it's probably helped the Iraqi people um, a great deal. And I don't know where I come down on that. And I think I probably have to end there. <laughs> I just want to call on Paul Heinbecker to close out our evening. Uh, what I wanted to say is uh, I sure wish you'd written that book about five years ago. Because uh, I went to New York uh, in uh, 2000 and uh, I didn't understand very well what the UNDP was about. And that would have been a very helpful thing for somebody like me to have. I just also wanted to comment on the issue of uh, consensus. The UN is operating in a situation where there's very little consensus. I was actually struck by it when you said the, uh, the, the degree of consensus that exists on democracy and human rights, uh, because it's, that's actually true. And it's probably the, it's one of the few bright lights, if any of the bright lights in that respect, because there's no consensus on even what the main issues are. are the, is the main issue terrorism? Well, not if you're one of the uh, uh, 500,000 uh, or a million uh, people who die in, uh, in third world countries from malaria. Uh, other countries' concerns about terrorism aren't such a, a, a big interest. Or if you're one of the 3 million people died of AIDS, or if you're one of the 14 million uh, um, uh, orphans in, in Africa. So there's no, you know, so is it, is it terrorism? Is it security? Is it development? Is it health care, education? There's not much consensus on any of that. Not much consensus on what to do about terrorism, not much consensus on what to do about climate change, and so on. So it's a very difficult environment that the UNDP works in. And the fact that it makes it does things like the uh, the one that comes most to my mind is the Arab uh, uh, Human Development Index and the end of reports. These are extraordinary documents. And the fact that the UNDP sort of incubated the idea of human security, which we in Canada then appropriated and changed a bit uh, for our own purposes. It's, it's been an extremely successful organization operating in very difficult circumstances. And the UN itself, the reform package, is not going to be easy. So I just wanted to say that uh, it's rare that we get in Waterloo. Somebody who, who has the insights Craig Murphy has, somebody who understands, somebody who can write, somebody who, who brings this kind of knowledge to us. And I'm very grateful to you for doing it. And it's a very, uh, I'm very glad for the audience who came out because you've had a treat. Thank you very much. And here is a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thanks. Do I get to open this one? I think so. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Oh. I think there are books. There are books.
There are books in the back of the room for those people who would like to have one and have it signed. Oh, wow. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Yes. It's really gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're great. 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 Now, I can. Thanks. That's mine. I can tell because it's this Norwegian.